All right, here we go. This is the important stuff. Let me get this going first. We're actually in Ezekiel, Ezekiel Ecclesiastes chapter 6. But it's important that we cover this. When I saw my ex-wife yesterday with her new boyfriend, I couldn't believe just how much he looked like me when we were still together. Miserable. This is, if you don't get this, this is about misery. Okay, so a wife is fed up with her weak, submissive, henpecked husband. And she demands that he leave her forever. So the husband does what he's told and he packs up. And as he's leaving out the door with his bags, his wife says, and I hope you have a slow and miserable death. And he stops and meekly says, so you mean you want me to stay now? Just want to do what you say, honey. Rain is pouring down heavily in the city, standing in front of a big puddle outside a pub. There's an old man. He's just standing in the rain. He's totally drenched. He's got like a stick in his hand with a piece of string dangling down in the puddle. And a young guy passing by, about to go inside the pub, says... What are you doing, sir? And he says, fishing. You feel sorry for the old man who's obviously something wrong with him. He's got a stick in the puddle. So he invites the old gentleman, come on inside the pub and, and let's get something to drink. And the guy puts his fishing rod down and goes inside and they're sipping whiskeys and Gentleman can't resist asking kind of in a mocking way. So, how many fish have you caught out there in the rain? He said, you're the fourth. <laughs> Some of y'all get that tomorrow. But... Miserable. All right, we're in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Y'all got that? Somebody, I hear somebody explaining it to somebody. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Okay. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. I want us to start over again. Let's catch verses 1 through 6, and then we'll move on from there because I want everybody to be up to date where we are. Someone want to read verses 1 through 6 for me? Anybody? You got it? Go for it. I have seen another evil <laughs> So he's basically saying that you can be wealthy and you can live 2,000 years. But if you're miserable and you can't enjoy it and you're miserable all the time, you've been better off never having been born. Now, is the problem the wealth? No. What's the problem if you're miserable yourself so what's what is it generally speaking it's choice isn't it I mean because if it's just events that are problematic who doesn't have those you got death in your family join the crowd you got accidents in your family join the crowd you got disease in your family. Join the crowd. You got people who are irritating in your family. Join the crowd. Right? 
So what makes a man miserable then? Well, he could have bad health, and that could be hard, but eventually we're all going to have bad health, right? You may not have it for long. You may have it for a couple of weeks and die. That would be the best thing that could happen to any of us, I guess, you know, just get sick and die. I mean, just boom. Don't lay there months and 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 years and whatever in pain. Nobody wants that for anybody. So it's not, what is he talking about then, this live 2,000 years and miserable? It's all to do with what? Attitude. So he's saying that to never be born is to better than to be born and live 2,000 years and have a grippy attitude. And by the way, it's better for you never to have been born than to live with somebody if you have a grippy attitude. Because <laughs> they've got to live with you. Amen? Yeah, that's, that's, that's an important lesson, isn't it? And, and it really has nothing to do with anything you'll be taught much in this life. And it mainly has to do with what the Lord teaches you, right? Learn to be grateful, you know, and smile. Absolutely. Absolutely. Except when you're flying. But um, that's right. <laughs> All right. I want to read verse 7, 8, and 9. Someone, sure. Sure. Stop me. That's right. Remember? All right. So. Right, so this he's talking about is when you don't have God in your life, you're miserable, right? Okay, when you don't have God in your life, don't really believe in God, don't really go for it, where do you go? Crave. You just all die. We all die. He's not talking about eternally. Well, he may be if the Lord wants to save us all, but he ain't sending us all to hell because that would really been a waste of time now, wouldn't it? Let's have the earth go thousands of years of the earth and send them all to hell. Well, that would be like, uh, that was a mistake on your part. God made a mistake if that's what happens. Right. It's just strictly dying. He's not talking about your soul. He's just talking about dying. All right. Uh, somebody want to read for me 7, 8, and 9? Big reader? It's loud. I, yeah, there you go. It's your turn this time. Yeah, Keegan just jumped in there. He doesn't know that, though. But it's... It's okay, <laughs> gotta be quick. <laughs> All man's labor is for his mouth, and yet yet that is not satisfied. So what advantage does the wise man have over the fool? What advantage does the poor man have knowing how to walk before the living? What the eyes see is better than what the soul desires. This too is futility and a striving after the wind. Okay, so this whole little section is about really not getting enough and, and yet getting enough. It's, it's the idea of not really, so you, your job you, will not really satisfy your soul. Now, it's going to feed you. Your job will feed you. It'll put food in your stomach. So you have food in your stomach, and you'll have enough in your stomach, but it's not enough to food, feed your soul. It's just not going to do it. It's not, the, man isn't just a beast. We're not. We're more than that. And because we're more than that, this idea about just having all you need, you know, let's be honest, the world thinks you got money, you got health, and you got food, and you can be as immoral as you want to be. They think that's the life, right? And the truth is, is that in, they think jobs, and, and that's the big thing. And the thing is, is that it doesn't feed your soul. Jobs don't feed your soul. In fact, if anything, I would suspect a lot of damage has been done by jobs on souls. I mean, especially you've got to fire somebody. If you've got to fire somebody at, at Christmas, I don't care who you are. That's going to hurt you. That's going to damage you. And you may not have a choice, and you still got to let them go. And here it is at Christmas. You know what I mean? And you can say, well, I'll just quit. Well, that, that's okay. They'll just fire less, but they'll still fire. <laughs> you can't stop them. And, and if the job demands, and I'll, let's be honest, a lot of you men are going to recognize what I'm fixing to say. The ladies that haven't done this as much 
Like if you're a traveling sales guy and you're expected to produce some numbers, sometimes those numbers can be fudged to keep your job. I'm not saying people do that, but I've heard people doing stuff like that, just trying to keep their job, right? Because they got a family at home and they're scared to death they're going to lose what they got. And people will do it. And it wouldn't be the first time. So it, it's more difficult. So second thing, though, is being smart enough is not enough. It's not enough. It's just not enough. I don't, I don't know who's the smartest person in the room right now. One of you probably got a 160. I don't know. It's probably a 160 in here. I'm not 160, I promise you that. <laughs> I, I'm not. So you're 160. God bless you. It's not going to help you a bit. Well, I'm higher than 160. I'm 160. Well, God bless you. You're probably going to be more miserable. Okay? So it isn't, being smart enough is not enough. If you don't have that God component, I don't care how smart you are. You got trouble coming. It's the only thing that'll keep you sane. Some of those late nights. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Midnight, one in the morning, three in the morning. The only thing that'll keep you sane is God. Especially if you're pretty smart. And I know we got a lot of smart people in this church. And if you're one of them, God bless you. Just remember, without God, you're liable to lose it one day. It's hard to keep the wiring in place. Okay? The wiring get crossed. And you can go nuts in the night more than you think. I'm not talking about going nuts permanently, but at least that night. You can have some really bad nights. Two, three in the clock in the morning. And then um, wanting and getting isn't enough either. Verse 9. I mean, so you want and then you get it. Have you not noticed what happens? Immediately you're deflated. <laughs> what is, I want it, I want it, I want it. You got it. And then he's like, oh, I want that now. <laughs> what is that? How long does the getting joy last? Three months, maybe? Six months? Got a brand new boat. Got a boat. Wow, we got a boat. Now it's, we got to get the boat out of the water or the blade of rust. We got to wash the boat down. The boat, I forgot to get the tag. I just got a, you know, I got a ticket. <laughs> we caught too many fish last. You know, and, and it's, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just getting what you want doesn't give you what you want. Isn't that crazy? Getting what you want doesn't give you what you want. What is it that you want? You want that inner thing that you can't scratch. Scratched. You've got something down inside of you itching. What is it that's itching that's making you go for all this junk? It's that God itchy place. It's that spiritual thing. It's that doing something greater. Being a part of something great. Being part of something, doing something for something. That's, that's where the itch is. And you just don't realize it. You think it's in that other thing. I'm going to get a new car. I'm going to get that new truck I've always wanted. I finally got that new truck. Do you know that that truck has this wrong with it? They've got something. They did something wrong with this truck. Isn't it like that? So you get it. It's not what you want. All right. So that's, that whole section is kind of called employment without enjoyment. Your, your job can't satisfy your soul. Your mind really can't replace your heart and your dreams are not really going to replace reality. So you dream for something. Yes, sir. And, and the other two as well. I mean, it's basically, I'll give you all this, all the kingdoms of the earth, power. That's the power thing, you know? And so, it, it, you know, it's amazing. You think it will, though. We all think it will. We try. And, and it isn't wrong to have those things. 
It's just you've made a mistake if you give everything you've got to them because it won't give you what it really is that you're wanting. It's not wrong to have it, but don't think it's going to really scratch that itch. It won't. You'll still be itching. All right. I need to read uh, chapter 6, verses 10 through 12 now, somebody. And we'll finish out that chapter. Chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. So basically life is pretty meaningless without God. If it's just life under the sun and all we have is this world, there's not a lot of meaning in it. Not a lot of purpose in what we're doing. So without God, we don't even know what in the world we are. You say, well, I'm a human. What's that? What is a human? What is a man? Now, talk about it without God. Let's just, for a moment, Let's just assume there's no God. What is a man? Somebody wanted to define it? Come on. What is a man? Let's forget it. Let's just for a minute, let's say we're all atheists. None of us believe there's a God. Tell me what a man really is then. Top of the food chain. That's good. Anything else? Why does he have a mind like he has? Do you really need to be this smart to be the top of the food chain? Why are you so fragile? Why do you cry? What's that about? A bunch of babies? What is it? So it, it just doesn't make sense, does it? Outside of there being a God, it ends up just being very hollow, doesn't it? It ends up, so you want to pursue life without God, you go for it, buddy. Into the abyss you go. Because that's where you're headed. The abyss of nothing and nonsense. That's where you're headed. Uh, how about this? Without God, or I mean with God, here's what we do know. We know we're foolish. If there is a God, okay, now we're back into there's a God, right? You know what I know about man? He's foolish. <laughs> I mean, the best one is still pretty foolish, isn't he? What's the wisest person you've ever known? I guarantee you they've done something they, they're not going to tell everybody about. <laughs> they've done something really silly, something really foolish, right? Done something you like, uh, how did I live through that? How did I do that and not die, right? You know, something really silly. How, how did I do that and not lose everything I've got? So we do foolish things. So that makes you like, actually, you know what that tells me though? What does that tell you? If we're all that foolish and there is a God, what does that really tell you? Clearly there's more to what's going on. There's an educational process going on. Some kind of process is going on pretty serious. Okay, without God, no one knows how to live best. Let's say now back, we're back to the atheist, right? There's nobody in here that believes. Tell me, which one of you knows exactly how you ought to live? And why we should all listen to you? All this rioting lately to me is people just screaming at each other and everybody knows how to live but the person listening, and they're not listening because they're screaming back. Why? Because the truth is, without God, nobody knows what to tell you what to do. Ain't nobody got a... Oh, well, we did a survey. 
no big deal. That's just a bunch of people got together and answered questions. That doesn't give you an answer. Yeah, it gives you the answer. No, it doesn't. That's to me, to, survey science is a little questionable. <laughs> I'm just like, seriously, that's just a little bit on the questionable side of that science, okay? I know it's mathematically correct, but if you can do statistics, here's what I believe. St statisticians are all liars. So, um, so you just, they're just liars. They just, they just fudge the data. You just fudge the data. How, what good is it? What good is a survey? Really? Well, I, we need a survey to tell me how to feel better. Well, it's going to work maybe for the ones that feel better. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. Absolutely. The, the little girl or the little guy on the phone, they don't have a choice about that. They're get, doing what they were paid to do, right? Exactly. exactly. And the question, and the, it, how many of you actually said did a dissertation? If you did a historical dis, a question on dis, dissertation in school. If you do a dissertation often and you do one of these, you have to learn how to ask a question that's supposedly not twisted and it's almost impossible. Do you, do you know how hard it is to ask a question that doesn't have a bias to it? It is very, very hard to ask a question that's unbiased. And you know what? You learn when you ask unbiased questions almost nothing because the data doesn't, it's just this kind of thing. It's a little ticket, a little. You don't get much. You just don't get much. It's like, okay, let me give you one. Here's one that, that they'll, they will twist it until the day we die. And I've heard it twisted a hundred times. What's the percentage of Americans on average before COVID that attend church? Do you know that that number has been consistent for as long as they've been keeping records? It doesn't vary but three to four percent since the beginning of keeping records. It runs somewhere between 39 and 44 percent on every proper survey since they've been keeping records. But they'll make it sound like they ain't but 25 percent of people attending church. Why? Because that sells magazines. That sells articles. And don't you forget that the number one thing on all of this is money. Every single study is money. There's money connected to it somehow. So... You just don't get the truth. So now if we're talking about this, who has the answer to how best to live your life if we're all a bunch of atheists? Nobody. Nobody. All right, last, last little point. With God, uh, we recognize someone knows the future and it ain't me. Somebody knows the future. Because if, if somebody doesn't know the future, this isn't a test. But if somebody does know the future, then it becomes a test. And if this is a test, it's a very sophisticated test. You've never even been able to think of a test this sophisticated. This puts you in, in grammar school. The best you can do is recognize when it's happening that it's a test. When things go wrong, and then something else goes wrong, and then something else goes wrong, best thing to do is just start laughing. <laughs> and say, man, I'm being tested right now. <laughs> right? The, don't go kick your dog. Just recognize it's a test. It's all a test, sophisticated as it may be. All right, let's go into chapter 7. Uh, let's try to read the first uh, 10 verses of chapter 7. Somebody want to read a lot of uh, stuff. If you, if you don't grab it quick, Keegan's probably got it. Woo. Through 10. Is that too much? Keegan will finish.
Okay, so I want to ask a few questions here. I want y'all to answer. Look at verse 1 again. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Um, what are people going to say at your passing? Does that matter to you? It should matter. What would you like them to say? Christian, any other thoughts? What would you really like said? Wow. That's a good one. They love Jesus more because they knew her. Anybody? What is it you want said? Somebody's going to stand over you one day, even if you're just powder, and they're sprinkling it somewhere. Right? What do you want them to say? To be missed? No, that's good. That's good. I got a similar one, you know, three, three things. What do you want? The three guys die in a car wreck, go to heaven. And uh, it says, uh, what do you want uh, people to say at your funeral? And each one has something they want said. And the last one says, look, he's moving. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll move on. Maybe that's too heavy. Here's one. Uh, what changes, uh, verse 2, look at verse 2. Uh, better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. So, uh, what uh, changes your friends that you do? Or, or what you do, or would your death change them more the things you do changes your people in your life makes them better or you're dying would maybe teach them more what a question now. Yeah, but, so what do you do that changes people makes them better do you do things that makes people better the people around you you do anything that makes them better, makes them better people. What do you do, you think, that makes people better people around you? Or would, would everybody maybe go, oh, I need to change my life because I see what he did or she did and I need to change because they live the way I want to. Which would change more people, do you think? Tough question, then. Are you doing things that are changing people's lives now? Because of what you do now, lives around you change. In other words, do you create an environment where people naturally want to be better? In other words, when you walk into the room, okay, it isn't just your aftershave they smell. You know, it's not just your, that you actually create an environment that people do better when you're around. They see you maybe working hard, they work hard, or they see you having a positive attitude, they develop a positive attitude. What is it you do makes people better? Tough question, isn't it? Yeah. Or will, will it be... Or will we all wait until you die and when you die everybody goes and says, you know, I need to do better because he did better than me. Okay, verses 3 and 4. Let's try that one. Uh, so Sarah kind of leaves uh, better songs than silly people. So comedy is good, uh, but does you ever actually been a better person because you listened to a comedian?
Anybody know a good comedian? Yeah, apparently you're going to be married to him a long time. <laughs> oh, she's not going to make it with you, I guess. <laughs> Ah, that's good. So, what's your favorite? Anybody got a clean comedian they like? Tim Hawkins. Tim Hawkins. Okay. Do, do I know him? Tell me, tell me a joke he tells. What is he doing? It's not that funny. I guess. <laughs> you can't tell it in mixed company. Is that what you meant? That's the worst. Okay. Sounds funny. Okay. I can't think of a last name. Sean Pierce. Sean Pierce. Also Christian? Ish, whatever the word is. So, uh, anybody else? Sounds good. So, it's a girl that's funny. What? Prove it. <laughs> Jerry Clower. Yeah. Shoot up amongst this one of us. Got to get some relief. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things. What comedy? Oh, you mean the ones I read earlier? I, I will tell you this. Sometimes comedy is the only way to get through an elders meeting. <laughs> you got to laugh at some of the stuff we talk about. You're the only elder in here right now, I think. Yes. You don't get to hide it, do you? So, I mean, you know, and I, oh, I like the, what he kind of ends on too is, you know, remembering the former days are better than now. That's not really true. Uh, sin is sin is sin is sin is sin. Sin's been sin from ever. And it's always going to be sin. And by the way, a lot of things weren't better back then. Cars are built better now than they were. Uh, medicine's better now than it used to be. Uh, Air conditioning's much better than it used to be. Uh, d dentists are better than they used to be. Um, so there's a lot of things that are better. Everything's not perfect, but a lot of things are better. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How many more days you got? <laughs> Less number <it> is. <laughs> All right. We need to end. Uh, pray with me. Holy Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to, to take a few moments to read your word. We pray, Father, that stimulated within us a little more wisdom. Help us to recognize how essential you are to our lives. Uh, Father, it's been such a blessing just to be among good, honest, faithful believers who come out in the middle of something like COVID and still trust you and still just trying to do the right thing, Father. We pray that you'll help us to be wise enough so that we will have an impact upon the lives around us. Help us try to make the day brighter for everyone and show a little wisdom. Bless us the rest of this day. We ask it all in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Y'all have a great day.